Hey everybody, this is Dan LaPelle for New Focus Recordings. Uh, happy to be joined by three-fourths of the Bergamot Quartet to chat about their uh, new album coming out on Friday, uh, May 6th, In the Brink. So we have Irene Hahn, Sarah Thomas, and Lita Fink. Hey guys. And uh, Amy Tan is here in spirit. How's everybody doing? Good, thanks Great. for having us. Yeah. yeah, sure. Thanks for, for making a little time to, to talk about the record. Uh, well, it's, it's a really great uh, program that I think covers a lot of territory and, and sort of captures a nice range of what you guys do. Uh, how did you sort of settle on this particular set of pieces? Um, the main impetus was that these were four works that we loved that were um, near and dear to our hearts that didn't have a studio recording at that point. <laughs> so we thought it would be super cool to provide them with those. Um, and they're four really different pieces. Um, so we thought it made for a really interesting like range of sound palette. Yeah, no, definitely. It, it, are all these pieces pieces you guys have been sort of playing a lot live or some of them are a bit newer and now you're going to play live or sort of a range? I'd say we've been living with these pieces for a while. Definitely we encountered them at, at slightly different times, yeah. um, but we have been playing them all live over the course of the, the last uh, year for some of them, two or three years for others. Um, so it was, uh, really like exciting for us to see these become sort of part of our core core rep these last couple of years, and that also was, I think, something to, that led us to think, oh, these really should have a recording. <laughs> yeah, no, um, we love these; we're playing them so much, and and it's um, you know time to bring it to the world in a different way. Yeah, each one of them, I think, for for various different reasons, uh, I really expect that other groups are going to be excited about you know adding them to their repertoire too so um yeah, that's a big hope of ours sorry that's a big hope of ours we really want other people yeah to totally to. I mean, that's, that's one of the main motivating factors to to making the recording so um well maybe we should talk a little bit about the the first piece on the record ode on a broken loom by paul wianco uh how long have you guys been playing this and uh when did you connect with paul uh, we first heard this piece when we were at Banff, um, Evolution of String Quartet. It was written for the Eibler Quartet, um, their um, early music um, string quartet, and they play on period instruments. And then we really loved it, and we also loved Paul, so we started learning it right after, um, and that was pre-COVID um, 2019, I think? 2019, yeah. Cool. That's interesting. I didn't realize that it was written for a period instrument quartet, but that's sort of actually, it makes sense given the, the sort of sinewy texture of the lines and stuff. Uh, and the notes are, are really cool and evocative, evocative. So the inspiration here is a loom, right? And, and the idea that like these notes are like fibers. Uh, did you guys have a chance to actually like talk to him about that? a bit and sort of did he uh it's just it's a very creative idea and one that i i don't think i've ever run across but it it, it it's it really works well paul himself is an amazing cellist and yeah. i think he is really inspired by just the sound of the strings instruments and how particularly a string quartet um is literally made of these interwoven fibers of sound um and you, you really see those patterns come through in the music that he wrote for this piece um and it's also just a piece that feels really, really good to play on our instruments. Um, he has such a gift for writing these luscious harmonies and lines that just feel amazing to play. Um, and it takes us some, from one texture to the next in such a graceful way. Um, it's called Own on a Broken Loom, but um, <laughs> um, there is this really graceful quality to the whole piece. Um, it 
we, we talk a lot about these different kind of colorful patterns that we see within the piece and the way that different like intentional hiccups in the writing become this whole sequence of events. It's just really rich in storytelling. Great. Well, let's let's listen to the first minute or so of Paul Wianco's uh, Ode on a Broken Moon. <laughs> So then the next uh, piece on the album is Tanya Leone's Essencia. Uh, and this is also a first recording, which I was sort of surprised to learn. It's such a substantial piece. And uh, yeah, that's, I mean, it's sort of like a, a gift in a way to be able to sort of discover the piece and, and make the first recording of it. And you guys played it beautifully. Um, was it something that she, suggested like you were in touch with her and she said oh actually nobody's actually played this piece or you guys did some digging and, and found out about it or good question yeah that actually that really surprised us also um a mentor of ours brought the piece to our attention and mentioned that he didn't think there were any recordings and sure enough we couldn't find any recordings not yeah. not just studio recordings but we couldn't find anything on youtube or otherwise yeah. um so it, it truly was like a, a really unique experience in that way. Um, getting to know, I, I was going to say an older piece, of course, it's not a very old piece, but it is about 10 years old um, for the first time and not really being able to listen to it. Um, usually if we have that kind of experience, it's with something we've commissioned or something that's been written the last couple of years. Um, so yeah, we, we read through it together and could tell that it was going to be a piece that we loved <laughs> um, and decided that we wanted to include it in this album. And then at that point we were in touch with her. Yeah. Um, so great. I mean, she is really prolific. I feel like every time I go back and do a search, I discover another guitar piece that she's written that, that also like nobody's played yet or nobody's recorded. Uh, so there's so much richness in, in her catalog, I think still to be discovered, but string quartet, you would think, you know, it's like, there's so many quartets and, and Tanya's music is getting played a lot, but this is, it's, it's just great that you guys discovered it. Uh, it's a wonderful piece and it's sort of really like, I think speaks to how she's able to draw influences from, uh, from a lot of different sources and just sort of seamlessly integrate them together. Uh, do you want to just, we're going to listen to a little bit of the second movement. Do you guys want to set this up a little bit? Agua de Rosas. So each movement of the piece is um, entitled Agua de something. Um, the first movement is um, Agua de Florida. Second, as you just said, is Agua de Rosas. The third is Agua de Manantial, which means spring. Um, and we just think these titles are really evocative. Um, there is this sense of like flowing through them. Like there's something very, <laughs> I don't know, this is a little corny, but water-like about all of them. Um, and it, they really begged a lot of like deep diving into the notes to, to find that essence within the piece. Um, and the second movement in particular, it's probably our favorite of the three movements, although we love them all. Um, it's just so, deep like the I don't know <laughs> it's kind of hard to explain almost which is which is good because it's a piece of music and in the end it doesn't need words but um you'll hear these incredibly luscious just 
flowing melodies um, interspersed with really rhythmic sections. Um, so it's kind of, a, it, it's a good kind of summation of the piece, I think, because um, it really goes back and forth between those characters. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just really vividly picture a rose garden whenever I hear it. I think I would even oh, cool. if I didn't know the title. <laughs> yeah. Well, in, in her program notes, she uh, is, is really sort of specific about some of the styles that uh, she drew on, not necessarily specific to this movement, but in general. She mentioned son, danzon, uh, guajiras, montunos. And it, I mean, it's just listening through, I, I don't have a, a, a sort of intimate enough knowledge on all of those styles to necessarily re uh, recognize what is happening when, but you, you can hear the sort of snippets that she's embedding uh, and it, it at least have enough recognition to be like, okay, yeah, I hear how that's like sort of borrowed from this musical culture and sort of woven into what she's doing in general. And it just takes you through a lot of really interesting uh, territory material. So very cool piece. Uh, here is the second movement of Essencia by Tanya Leon, or not the whole second movement, but a minute or so of it. So it was also really great uh, that you guys could include your piece, Lita, uh, for quartet and, and drum set. And sort of, I think that speaks to the fact that you guys do uh, a lot of music that one of you has written or that maybe, is it accurate to say that some of it is collaboratively written? Not this piece necessarily, but in general, like some of your work. Um, we did one write one piece collaboratively, which was a collaboration with a fashion designer. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, that was a super fun project. Yeah. In the Brink wasn't written together, but it was, of course, written with deep consideration of the unique strengths of Bergamot. Yeah. Um, on my behalf, which I was really, really grateful for. Cool. I guess I just mean like the wide range of stuff that you guys do. Maybe that would have been a better, better way to say it. Um, What's it like, you know, balancing a drum kit on stage with a string quartet is tricky. Do you guys amplify or is Terry playing with like brushes or just super restrained or how does that work? Um, that's a good question. I, when I'm writing the piece, I really wanted to integrate the two instruments, the string quartet being one of the instruments um, as much as possible. Um, and. I kind of pointedly didn't want the drummer to play like a typical drum kit role in the piece. Um, Terry's part is mimicking the strings in a lot of areas. Um, and there are certain segments of the piece where I've asked all of us to improvise together um, in ways that kind of put certain limitations on the drums, but we don't play it amplified. Um, Terry, of course, is an extremely sensitive drummer. So we didn't have to tell him to be quiet too many times. <laughs> um, he was just really, yeah, just really a sen very sensitive collaborator the whole way through. Mm -hmm. um, but there are also moments where the strings are kind of mimicking drums in certain ways. There's like a muted pizzicato that second violin and viola do in one section of the fourth movement. Um, and at the end of the piece, of course, Terry's actually playing on Amy's viola with fiddlesticks, which is a, 
oh, cool. trick I stole from my past as a fiddler. Um, I, I guess I didn't realize that. Uh, that that's super cool. Um, I guess if, if there's a concert video of it somewhere, then people could see that in that context. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the drums sort of set up this second movement uh, and then the quartet comes in. Do you, do you want to say anything more about it before we, we take a listen or just uh, dive in? Um, I guess just that the there, there's a, a text in this movement, which I wrote. Um, the idea behind the piece was to kind of use these five instruments to um, paint various scenes um, of, I was thinking a lot about natural disasters when writing this piece, but that for me was a mode of engaging with just this larger concept of um, communication breakdowns <laughs> between humans. Um, I kept, I didn't, I didn't want to get too specific with the text, but I did really want there to be an element of our literal voices in the piece. Um, so you'll hear those in very different ways throughout the piece um, yeah. in the second and the fourth movements. Um, and also, since you mentioned the performance video, we, we are releasing this week a video made by 410 Media of the piece with Terry, which we're super excited about. Um, you can see a glimpse of Fiddlesticks at the end oh, of yeah. it, <laughs> if you're All curious. Right. Get, get the Fiddlesticks fix from that, from that video when it comes out. Great. Actually, while we're mentioning about sort of other things to keep in mind, there's a release event on May 17th. Is that am I right. getting the date right? That's right. Yeah, at, it's at, at seven thirty. Space in Brooklyn. Is that right? right? Mm -hmm. So everybody, keep your eyes peeled for that and head down to uh, Fort Greene to, to celebrate the release of the album. Uh, cool. So yeah, let's listen to the more or less opening of Movement Two of In the Brink. Uh, this is Flood of Ashes. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the way that you, in a way, sort of bridge the gap between the, the world of percussive sounds and the world of bowed strings by, it, well, a lot of pizzicato, but then also the vocalizations and the hand claps and stuff, it, not necessarily all in the excerpt we just heard, but in general in the piece, I think is, was really cool. It sort of creates a, a, a greater integration between the, the sound worlds. It's really great. Um, so the final... Well, it's not actually the final piece. It's the third piece on the record, but the, the one that we haven't touched on yet is Suzanne Farron's Undechin, uh, which I may or may not be pronouncing correctly. And uh, this is, in a sense, Suzanne's grappling with memory, but memory through the, sort of through the lens of the bow, right? Like the idea that the bow inhabits this sort of memory of all the music that it may have played over the years. What was uh, what was your evolution with that piece or that idea like? Yeah, this is another piece that we encountered um, at Banff around the same time we uh, encountered Paul's piece, but it's, it's a bit of an older piece. It's also about 10 years old or so. Um, and we met Suzanne there. I, I think that's just such a beautiful idea of the instruments inhabiting this music and, and holding on to it while the music itself maybe evolves and um, looks slightly different now. I mean, slightly, a lot different in some ways and not very different at all in others, right? Um, 
yeah i think irene you had something to say about this uh yeah i just thought um i remember when we were practicing and learning it just having a really fun time just imagining that i was possessed <laughs> in one arm and um yeah it's it's a very imaginative piece and i love the sound world that she dives into and and of course there's that amy solo that big viola solo that's my favorite moment that happens in the piece so just yeah to look for. it's it, it's it's a pretty intense piece you know it's i feel like some music that might reference memory it might sort of suggest something a bit more ethereal or and but that's not this at all this is more like the really sort of grappling with hang on and letting go and that component of of memory and, and one's relationship with memory uh, and it really sort of casts this long structural arc it's a it's a cool experience to hear it it's a cool pairing with Paul's piece too, I think, because while Paul's was written for period instruments with gut strings, um, Suzanne's piece was written for modern instruments. Um, it was written in 2006 for a group of players at, um, at SUNY Purchase where she used to teach. Um, but it literally asks of us that we imagine as if our bow arms were possessed by spirits from Baroque era. <laughs> right, yeah, um, interesting. So we have to work with these kind of um, this lexicon of techniques taken from a much earlier time in strings writing, um, but in very different ways. And I think Paul's piece really looks ahead while Suzanne's piece really looks backwards, but kind of for swapped um, yeah. era of instruments. That's a, uh, that's sort of a cool hallmark of a lot of her music, actually. Um, this idea of of sort of inhabiting like an older affect but but applying it to some sort of more contemporary techniques uh, her other two albums on, on the label both sort of do that to a fairly large extent cool let's listen to uh about a minute of undecim suzanne Ferrin. <laughs> sort of get to chat a little bit with you guys about uh, these pieces. Again, it's In the Brink, FCR 316, coming out this Friday, May 6th. And uh, lest we forget to mention some of the really great people who were also part of this project, uh, the album art, both the image behind me and also throughout the, the packaging was by Alex Sop. Uh, graphic design by Amy Tan, the violist in, in the quartet. Uh, there's a photo of you guys by Corey Hayes. Um, Sam Torres recorded, mixed, and mastered the record. And uh, did Paul produce the whole thing or just his piece? Paul produced the whole thing. Sam oh, co-produced on the pieces recorded in Troy. Great. So cool. So yeah, recorded at uh, Troy Savings Bank, which has been such an important place for people to record stuff for so many years wonderful sound there um and your piece was recorded uh by matthew and mixed by matthew sullivan lita uh and assisted by nikki young uh special thanks to mike tierney i'm not sure what what was mike tierney's role sorry the 
I should know. provided some mentorship to to Matt Sullivan during the recording awesome. process at Reservoir Studios. Very cool. Um, any other people that I'm forgetting? You guys want to mention? No. I think. Well, I think the huge thanks is always in order to our mentors, the Jack Quartet. Um, Absolutely. And a lot of their hours coaching us on these pieces throughout the last yeah. couple of years so we're really grateful to them yeah absolutely and and also grateful that they connected us uh yes. cool Bye. well thanks for for taking a few moments and encourage everybody to check uh the album out all the places you would expect to to find music Bandcamp, our site uh major uh, monolithic corporate platforms that stream and sell music and uh, congratulations, wonderful album, and uh, look forward to hearing you guys again soon. May 17th, Jack Space release event for In the Brink. All right, take care, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you so much. I can't wait. Thank you.